Hey everyone, I'm Scott Milburn, Master Trainer at Aquatherm. Today we're going to be learning about the socket fusion process. Let's do a quick overview of the tools that we're going to need. First, we're going to need an iron and we're going to need the appropriate heater adapters. The heater adapters are going to be sized based on the pipe that you're using. There's a few different ways to find the size of the pipe that you're using, but the easiest way to find it is by looking on the print strip and you can see here where it says 20 20 by 2.8, we're working with 20 millimeter pipe today, or you can also see the nominal diameter right here, half inch nominal diameter. Additionally, we have other tools available. For example, if you're doing smaller diameter pipe, for example, 20 through 50 millimeter pipe, there's cold ring tools that you can use to aid in the socket fusion process. While these are helpful, they're not required for the process. Additionally, for larger pipe sizes, there are socket fusion assist tools that can aid in this. A lot of times it takes a lot of force to join these two components together. So for sizes two inch through four inch, or if you're looking at the metric sizing, that'd be 63 millimeter through 125 millimeter pipe. There's lots of different options for these socket fusion assist tools. Some are more specialized for doing work in the air, in line. Some are more specialized for doing work on a tabletop or doing fabrication. Make sure you consult with your tool manufacturer, or your local tool rep to see what's the best tool for you to use in your specific situation. So now that we've gone over the tools real quick, make sure that the first thing that you do is get your irons plugged in, okay? It takes a few minutes for these to get heated up, so you want those to be heating up while you work on other prep preparatory items, you know, maybe cutting the pipe or getting the rest of your area set up. I've got my irons plugged in. I've got the appropriate heater adapters on here. Specifically, we're gonna be working with half inch or 20 millimeter pipe today. And that's gonna be this front heater adapter right here that we'll be using. When these irons are plugged in, we need to wait for them to get to the appropriate temperature. That, for socket fusion, that temperature should be 500 degrees plus or minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So make sure you have a thermometer, whether that's an infrared thermometer or a contact pyrometer handy, so you can check that temperature, which I'm gonna do right now just to make sure that we're where we need to be. So I'm getting a good reading there. I'm right just under 500 degrees. I'm gonna make sure to check it on both sides. There's 497 degrees right there. So our irons are heated up and we're ready to proceed. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to cut our pipe to the correct length. There's lots of different cutting methods that we can use to cut, the, to cut our polypropylene pipe. For example, for smaller diameters, we can, use, uh, we can use ratchet cutters like these, okay? Be sure that when you're using ratchet cutters that the blade is sharp so that as you're cutting through the pipe, you don't crush the pipe and potentially overstress it. As you can see, we get a nice cut here. I, when you're cutting the pipe for socket fusion, you need to make sure you get a square cut. Specifically, we don't want that cut to deviate more than five degrees from square. That'll help ensure that we get good insertion when we actually join the pipe with the fitting. <clears throat> There's other cutting methods available. Depending, since socket fusion ranges from half inch all the way to four inch pipes, sometimes you'll be using ratchet cutters, sometimes you'll be using tube cutters. You may need to use uh, some kind of power cutter to cut the different pipes that you're going to be using. Just know there's lots of options available depending on your specific situation. So now that we have the pipe cut, the next thing that we need to do is we need to clean it prior to actually heating it up and fusing it together. So we're going to, always, we're going to remember to use our 91% isopropyl alcohol and a lint-free cloth. And we're going to clean the end of the pipe where we're going to be prepping it for socket fusion. Next, <clears throat> once the pipe is clean and dry, we're gonna grab our depth gauge and we need to mark the pipe to the specific insertion depth for the size that we're using. You can see on this depth gauge here that it has various sizes listed. Right? It, ranges from, on the, it ranges from 20 millimeter all the way through 125 millimeter pipe, and each of those pipe sizes will have a specific insertion depth for that size. We have the metric sizes on one side of the depth gauge, or the other side of the depth gauge lists the, lists the nominal pipe sizes. So go ahead and select whichever side is more familiar to you. 
The next thing that we need to do is we need to hang this depth gauge on the end of the pipe. <clears throat> you can see how it has a lip here that's going to hang on that end that we're going to be fusing to, and that's going to place the gauge correctly so that we can mark that insertion depth. Grab a permanent marker, find the hole that corresponds to the pipe size you're using. In this case, we have half inch pipe, or if you were hanging it the other way, we'd use the 20 millimeter hole here. Make a mark on the pipe at that insertion depth, and now you can see that we have the correct insertion depth for the pipe size that we're using today. The other thing that you want to do is you want to mark a small tail coming off of that mark. We do this because when we melt the pipe, there's going to be a small bead that forms. And sometimes that bead will roll over the mark that we make. By making this tail here, we can see where that mark is even after we fuse the two pieces together. Now that we have our mark, our pipe has been cleaned, we know, how, we know what our insertion depth should be. Now we can go ahead and proceed to the heat up process. So at this point, we need to consult our socket fusion parameters. We need, and that, was, that chart is going to tell us what our heat time should be. And we're going to base that heat time on the ambient temperature. Sometimes we have to use extended heat times if the temperature is cooler. But right now, since we're fusing at roughly, you know, roughly 70 degrees, we're going to use the standard heat, heating and cooling times. <clears throat> Just make sure you consult the chart for the appropriate heating time, the appropriate transition time, and then the appropriate cool down time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through, we're going to explain this process of fusion and then we're going to demonstrate it. So when we're inserting these two pieces onto the iron, we need to make sure we insert both to the full insertion depth. On the pipe side, we have a mark that will tell us when we get to the correct insertion depth. For the fitting side, if you notice on the if you notice on the heater adapter here, there's a small lip right before it reaches this larger face here. That small lip on the heater adapter is what indicates the full insertion depth for the fitting. Once we insert these two onto the iron and we reach that full insertion depth on both sides, then we'll start to count our heat soak time. Once that heat soak time has elapsed, we'll remove them from the iron, and then we'll join them together within the transition time that, we've, that we found in those socket fusion parameters tables. Once they're joined, you'll have to hold them there for the duration of the cool down time until they set and reach their full joint strength. So let's go ahead and demonstrate this. So first, I'm going to insert this onto the iron, and I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five. Remove these from the iron quickly, join them together, make sure that they're properly aligned as you join them, and you insert the pipe into the fitting until you reach the full insertion depth. At this point, we're going to hold it here until these two pieces set up. You'll have about 10 to 15 seconds to do any alignment or, may, or, or adjust the fitting till it's level. Make sure that whatever adjustments you're doing, they are very minor. We shouldn't ever be twisting the fitting on the pipe. We want to make sure we prevent any water contact during this, during this fusion process. And we always want to make sure that we're using enough heat. As we saw before, we checked our iron to make sure it was at that proper temperature, that 500 degrees, plus or minus 18. And you want to make sure you check that temperature regularly throughout the day, preferably before, before you do a fusion each time. So now that these two pieces are joined together, we can inspect them. So if we look at the bead here, we should see a full, full melt bead from the pipe, which we can see here. Here's the blue melt all the way around the pipe. And then when you look at the fitting, there's also a green melt bead from the fitting all the way around the fitting. So that's our inspection criteria. We need to make sure that the two pieces are straight. The, the joining angle should never exceed more than, or should never deviate more than three degrees from straight. And then we should see full melt beads from the pipe and the fitting all the way around the joint. Once we've verified that those beads are complete, and that the fitting has reached the insertion depth, and that the connection is straight, 
we can go ahead and place this aside and we can continue fusing on our next piece. Now let's take a look at a couple pieces where something went wrong. Alignment is a really important part of socket fusion because if the two pieces aren't aligned, you won't develop the proper pressure between the fitting and the pipe when they're fusing. And then you, that could lead to incomplete fusion and potentially leaks uh, during the pressure test or sometime in the future. So one uh, very, very prominent sign of misalignment is a missing bead on either the pipe or the fitting. So as we go around this piece here, we can kind of see, or we can see how the bead isn't consistently sized all the way around. You can see the blue bead here is pretty small, but yet on the exact opposite side of the fitting, it's very large, okay? And then we can also see that there's no green bead present here. Uh, like there's no, there's no green bead present on this side and it's likely covered up on this side where the bead is really large. So when, I, when, when this was put together, there is a, the two pieces were misaligned and where, what you can see is where the bead is really large. That means that the pipe was pressing excessively hard on that side of the fitting. And it wasn't developing the proper pressure on this side where that bead is very small. So misalignment is probably one of the more common uh, mistakes that can happen with socket fusion. So it's really important to ensure that your alignment is correct, especially when you're doing socket fusion by hand. That's where tools like cold ring tools, like we showed earlier, can help uh, can help maintain that alignment and square connections. Another common issue in socket fusion that, can, that specifically occurs in larger diameters is, ova is ovality related issues. So when you're, using <coughs> when you're using a socket fusion assist tool like these, you have to clamp the pipe and the fitting in these jaws here. Now, if you, clamp the, if you clamp the fitting too hard, what you can do is begin, you can begin to crush the face of the fitting, and that will deform the, that'll deform the socket where you're going to be inserting the pipe. And what that results in is when you, when you crush this fitting by clamping it too hard, you'll, you'll oval this fitting, which will basically, it'll cause the top to, be, to elongate and it'll crush in the sides. And now when you heat it up, you can see here that you get these heavy beads on the side where the jaws are, are crushing the, the fitting in, but there's no beads on the top and the bottom where, the, where, the, where the, the long part of that oval exists, right? Because you're crushing the fitting and now the top and the bottom are getting longer and they're not making any contact with the pipe. And then when you fuse them together, you can see you get a missing bead on the bottom and, uh, and exactly opposite on the top on the fitting, but the bead on the pipe will look relatively normal because the pipe isn't getting oval, it's melting correctly, but the fitting is not melting correctly. And if we get, if we fuse a piece like this, it's very likely that we can get leaks on those parts of the fitting where you don't see a bead. So it's important when you're doing any kind of machine assisted fusion that you don't over clamp the fitting specifically so you can avoid these ovality related issues. Now that we've seen how to do a proper socket fusion, let's review the process. So remember first, we're gonna select the correct heater adapters, get our irons plugged in, and make sure they reach that correct temperature of 500 degrees plus or minus 18. Next, we're gonna cut the pipe to the correct length. We're gonna clean the pipe with our isopropyl alcohol. We're gonna mark the pipe with our depth gauge to the correct insertion depth based on our pipe diameter. From there, we're gonna heat the pipe for the, for the appropriate amount of time. And remember, all these times, whether it's the heating time, the transition time, or the cool down time, they all come from the socket fusion parameters table. We're gonna heat the pipe for the correct amount of time, then we're gonna join the two pieces together, and then we're gonna hold them in place for the full cool down time until that joint reaches its full strength. I hope this overview of socket fusion was helpful. Thanks for taking the time to watch. If you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to your local Aquatherm representative.